when a magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake tore through the seafloor off Kamchatka on July 29, 2025, the world's seismic networks lit up in unison. It was one of the largest quakes in modern record, shaking the Kuril-Kamchatka subduction zone, where the Pacific Plate is forced beneath the North American Plate. The tremor's reach was staggering. Its seismic waves raced across the Pacific, through the continents, and even rippled around the globe. But while its immediate toll was focused on Russia's Far East, the aftershock in the minds of scientists and the public was a bigger, more unsettling question. Could such a colossal displacement on one side of the Pacific Ring of Fire subtly influence faults on the other side, particularly the San Andreas Fault in California and the Cascadia subduction zone in the Pacific Northwest? The idea is tantalizing in its simplicity. The Pacific Plate is a continuous giant, spanning thousands of kilometers. And when it jerks violently in one place, might it push or pull against other locked sections far away? The Kamchatka quake was a massive landmass adjustment, tens of meters of slip deep beneath the seafloor. And it's tempting to imagine that the shock waves, both physical and tectonic, might ripple toward other vulnerable zones. After all, Cascadia's last full-rupture megathrust earthquake happened in January 1700. And Southern California hasn't seen a truly catastrophic San Andreas rupture since 1857. Both are widely regarded as overdue by historical averages. To the average person, overdue combined with giant quake across the ocean sounds like a recipe for a chain reaction. Seismologists, however, approach this with more caution. Earthquakes can influence one another in two primary ways. Static stress transfer and dynamic triggering. Static stress transfer is like bending a ruler until it snaps. When one part breaks, the strain changes along the rest of the ruler. In tectonic terms, when a fault slips, it can slightly increase or decrease the stress on nearby faults, sometimes making them more likely to fail, sometimes relieving them temporarily. But this effect decays rapidly with distance. By the time you're thousands of kilometers away, the additional stress is minuscule, measured in fractions of a bar compared to the multiple bars of stress needed to rupture a fault. For perspective, the Kamchatka rupture might have shifted stress on the Aleutian Trench in Alaska, which is directly connected along the same plate boundary. But its static stress influence on the San Andreas or Cascadia would be virtually negligible. Dynamic triggering, however, is a different animal. This is where the seismic waves themselves, racing through the Earth's crust and mantle at thousands of meters per second, can jostle faults far away. These waves are the ground motion you feel when a quake hits, shaking, rolling or rattling anything in their path. If a fault somewhere else is already teetering on the edge of failure, the passage of these waves might provide the final nudge, causing it to slip. Scientists have documented cases where large earthquakes have triggered distant tremors, sometimes even thousands of kilometers away, often in volcanic or hydrothermally active areas where crustal conditions are sensitive. The 2011 magnitude 9.0 Tohoku earthquake in Japan, for example, sent seismic energy racing around the world and small earthquakes were recorded in parts of California within hours, almost certainly triggered by those passing waves, but these were small magnitude threes and fours, not catastrophic eights or nines. Global statistical studies have found that magnitude 6.5 or larger earthquakes can cause a slight temporary increase in earthquake activity worldwide in the days that follow. The highest rates of these triggered events sometimes occur near the antipodal point the location directly opposite on the globe from the quake's epicenter, though these are still typically moderate in size. The pattern is real, but the scale matters. Just because seismic waves can nudge small faults into slipping doesn't mean they can cause a locked megathrust fault to suddenly let go. Think of it like shaking a tree. Loose branches may fall, but the trunk will stand until its own internal stresses bring it down. This is why, in the hours and days after Kamchatka's quake, scientists at the USGS and other agencies were monitoring the seismic chatter across the Pacific. 
but no one was expecting to see San Andreas or Cascadia go off like a gunshot. Any triggered quakes in California or the Pacific Northwest would almost certainly have been minor background tremors elevated by the passing seismic storm. Indeed, monitoring in the week after the event showed no unusual spike in large magnitude activity along the West Coast, though the usual background hum of microquakes continued. Still, the question persists because history sometimes plays tricks on perception. People remember clusters of great earthquakes and wonder if they were linked. In the early 1960s, the world saw the 1960 magnitude 9.5 Chile earthquake, still the largest ever recorded, followed just four years later by the 1964 magnitude 9.2 Alaska earthquake. The proximity and time and the shared Pacific Plate connection made it tempting to imagine cause and effect. But most geophysicists consider them independent, each driven by the relentless but local collision of tectonic plates. Similarly, the 2010 magnitude 8.8 .8 Maul quake in Chile was followed by the 2011 Tohoku quake in Japan. Again, these were separated by vast distances and driven by their own plate boundary processes, even if they occurred in the same general window of time. For San Andreas and Cascadia, the real danger comes not from distant shocks, but from the silent, steady push of their respective plates. The Pacific Plate grinds northwestward past the North American Plate along California at about 50 millimeters per year, roughly the rate your fingernails grow. Over decades and centuries, this steady creep locks up along fault sections, bending and storing energy in the crust until eventually it must break. Cascadia's story is similar, though instead of a sideways grind, the Juan de Fuca Plate dives beneath the North American Plate in a head-on subduction building the potential for a full-length rupture that could run from Northern California to British Columbia, releasing energy equivalent to multiple magnitude nine quakes combined. Both faults are on geological borrowed time. The Southern San Andreas segment has an estimated recurrence interval of about 150 years for major ruptures. It's been more than 165 years since the last one in 1857, a magnitude 7.9 that tore a 300-kilometer, 185-mile gash through the landscape. Cascadia's full rupture interval is more variable. Estimates range from 300 to 600 years. But at 325 years since 1700, it too sits in the zone of statistical expectation. That's what overdue means in seismological shorthand, not that a quake will happen tomorrow, but that enough time has passed since the last one that the historical odds are high. When you combine overdue with a fresh memory of a magnitude 8.8 .8 just across the Pacific, the imagination leaps to connections. Could Kamchatka's push or pull have added that final ounce of stress to an already strained West Coast fault? Scientifically, the answer is almost certainly no. Static stress changes vanish over such distances, and dynamic triggering effects are fleeting and modest. But psychologically, the linkage is powerful. The Pacific Ring of Fire is a single geologic system. It's 40 000 kilometer, 25 000 mile arc studded with volcanoes, trenches, and faults that produce about 90% of the world's earthquakes. When one end convulses, it's only natural to look nervously at the other. In the weeks after Kamchatka, earthquake preparedness agencies from Alaska to California found themselves fielding the same question. Are we next? It's the same question asked after Chile 1960, after Alaska 1964, after Japan 2011. The sober answer is that while the Ring of Fire is a connected system in terms of plate boundaries, the individual segments fail largely according to their own stress clocks. A quake in Kamchatka is more likely to jostle its immediate neighbours, the Kuril Islands, the Aleutians, than to snap a fault thousands of kilometres away. Yet that does not diminish the urgency for the West Coast. If anything, the Kamchatka quake serves as a visceral reminder of what's possible. It shows what happens when decades or centuries of strain are released in minutes, how the seafloor can leap by meters, how entire coastlines can shift, how a tsunami can cross an ocean in under a day. For Cascadia and San Andreas, it's not a matter of if but when, and when it happens, the numbers will be just as stark, rupture lengths of hundreds of kilometers, 
displacements of several meters, shaking lasting minutes instead of seconds. Whether triggered by a neighbor or not, the outcome is the same for the people in its path. While experts are clear that an earthquake in one part of the ring of fire cannot directly send a quake across an ocean, the relationship is more nuanced. The Earth is an interconnected system of lithospheric plates, and while energy dissipation happens locally, the adjustment of one section can influence the stress environment in others. It is less like a billiard ball striking another directly, and more like adjusting the tension in a massive, planet-wide web of elastic bands. The Kamchatka Peninsula, locked between the Pacific Plate and the Okhotsk Microplate, is one such knot in this web. And when it shifts in a major way, the effects ripple far beyond its immediate vicinity, not in a simple push, but in a complex pattern of changes to stress distribution. Researchers studying past great earthquakes have noticed that some events appear to cluster in time, even at great distances. The 1960 Valdivia earthquake in Chile, magnitude 9.5, remains the largest on record, and it was followed in the next four years by the 1964 Alaska magnitude 9.2 quake, and then the 1971 San Fernando event in California. While these were not direct chain reactions, Scientists have speculated that shifts in the Pacific Plate's stress regime played a role in the timing. More recently, the 2004 magnitude 9.1 Sumatra Andaman quake was followed by the 2010 magnitude 8.8 .8 Mall quake in Chile and the 2011 magnitude 9.1 Tohoku quake in Japan, all in the same ring of subduction zones, yet separated by thousands of kilometers. This has led some geophysicists to explore the possibility of remote triggering, where the global seismic network picks up subtle long-period oscillations that could slightly accelerate the clock on faults already nearing their breaking point. For Cascadia, which stretches from Northern California to British Columbia and hides a subduction zone capable of producing magnitude 9.0 plus events, the clock is already ticking. Geological evidence shows that the last great Cascadia quake occurred in January 1700. And paleoseismic data indicates a recurrence interval averaging 300 to 600 years. That means we are already well within the window where the next rupture could occur. The San Andreas Fault, by contrast, is a transform fault, sliding laterally instead of plunging downward, and it has its own cycle of stress accumulation. The southern San Andreas, in particular, has not ruptured in a major way since 1857, meaning over 160 years of strain have built up along its locked segments. Both faults, though different in character, are linked by their shared connection to the Pacific Plate's movement, which is influenced by far-field stresses from other parts of the Ring of Fire. After the July 29th, 2025 magnitude 8.8 .8 Kamchatka earthquake, GPS stations in the North Pacific registered minute shifts in position, not enough to be noticeable to the public, but detectable to scientists. These shifts, often on the order of millimetres, reflect changes in how plates are pushing or pulling on each other. The redistribution of mass and alteration of stress in the lithosphere following a megathrust event can subtly alter the stress field in other parts of the plate system. In some cases, the Coulomb stress change model predicts that such adjustments can either advance or delay the timing of another quake. While the change in California and Cascadia after Kamchatka's event is small, likely measured in fractions of a bar, it is not zero. And on faults that are already close to failure, even a tiny nudge could have consequences. The challenge lies in translating this scientific understanding into a probability. Agencies like the USGS avoid tying distant earthquakes to immediate forecasts for other regions because the statistical correlations are not strong enough to be predictive in a short time frame. Instead, they focus on long-term hazard models. For the southern San Andreas, these models estimate a roughly 19 to 31 percent probability of a magnitude 7.5 plus quake within the next 30 years. Cascadia's probability for a full margin rupture is estimated between 10 and 15 percent over the same period, though partial ruptures of the zone have higher odds. Adding the Kamchatka event into the mix does not dramatically change those numbers in official models, 
but it does serve as a reminder that the system is dynamic and interconnected. For the public, the danger is not in believing that a quake across the ocean will instantly cause one at home, but in underestimating how close our own systems may already be to their breaking point. In both Cascadia and along the San Andreas, the strain is real and measurable. Slip rate studies on the southern San Andreas show motion of about 25 to 35 millimeters per year, all of which has been locked since the last rupture. In Cascadia, GPS measurements confirm the slow but relentless squeezing of the continental margin as the Juan de Fuca plate dives beneath North America. Every year without a major release is another year of stored potential energy. There is also the role of dynamic triggering to consider. When a great earthquake happens, seismic waves circle the globe, some taking hours to complete multiple laps. These waves can rattle other fault systems, occasionally producing swarms of small quakes far from the epicenter. While these are not the massive events that capture headlines, they do confirm that stress transfer, in some form, is happening. The 1992 Landers earthquake in California, for instance, was followed by a spike in seismic activity in Yellowstone and Mammoth Lakes, hundreds of kilometers away. Similarly, Tohoku's 2011 rupture coincided with tremor bursts in Cascadia. It is not unreasonable to suggest that Kamchatka's 2025 event may have caused similar, if temporary, flurries of activity. Yet the leap from temporary stress change to imminent megaquake is a big one. Earthquakes do not follow human timetables, and while science can identify areas of high hazard, the precise timing remains elusive. What Kamchatka's shift offers is a case study in how even distant events can become part of the conversation about local readiness. It also underscores the value of a global seismic network where scientists can track not just the main shock and aftershocks, but the subtle long-term shifts in the planet's crust that follow. If history and geology tell us anything, it is that California and Cascadia will experience their own great earthquakes, if not tomorrow than in the years or decades to come. Whether Kamchatka's 2025 quake has moved that date forward by a day, a month, or not at all, is a question science may never fully answer. But the connections within the Ring of Fire are real, and they serve as a reminder that the boundaries we draw on maps are human inventions. The Earth's crust obeys only the physics of stress, strain, and release. Preparedness, then, is not about chasing the shadow of the last quake, but about understanding the inevitability of the next. Whether it begins in a deep subduction trench off the Pacific Northwest or along the dusty fault lines of Southern California, the next big one will test infrastructure, emergency systems and communities in ways that ripple far beyond the epicenter. The Kamchatka quake may fade from headlines, but its lessons about connection, about vigilance and about the global dance of tectonic plates should remain very much in the public mind. Stay alert, stay informed, and make readiness a habit, not a reaction. If you found this breakdown insightful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so you can stay ahead of the curve as we continue tracking the world's most powerful and mysterious forces.